Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney, retired. None of what follows is legal advice. I'm here to do some video for you today to talk about an interesting subject on the law, and here it is. I can't even imagine what it would be like to try to represent Sarah Boone in this case, this debacle that she has created for herself after nearly four years of being in custody and cycling through pretty much every criminal defense lawyer at the public defender's office, only to find herself with her ninth lawyer, a guy from Pensacola, who is coming in and trying to bat cleanup. I have a lot of sympathy for the guy because I think at this point, the judge and the prosecutor are tired of the games and they're tired of the gamesmanship. Now, I don't think he has been playing games. I think he is simply trying to do a workmanlike job of defending this woman. But by virtue of the strings that she has pulled up to this point, he is not going to get any kind of break. And so I think one of the ways that you see that is in the motions hearing that was held last week when she was trying to suppress her statements to the police. And of course, the reason that she was trying to suppress her statements to the police was because she wants to argue now that she was a battered spouse and that somehow that makes this a justifiable homicide in some ridiculous way. But the problem is that she has steadfastly maintained through the last four years that it was an accident, you know, the sun was in her eyes, she didn't know the gun was loaded, all that kind of stuff. And I don't think anybody believes any of that. And I don't think she's done a very credible way job of, of presenting that. And of course, most of this damage is self-inflicted and has gone on because she could never really reconcile with any of her attorneys who are representing her. And I think when the judge told her, boy, you're done, that's it, no more, no more public defenders, we ain't paying for nobody else. I think at that point, she realized, oh boy, you know, now I am really in the sauce. And she you took a hand up out of the pit from the guy from Pensacola. But I want you to watch this first little bit here where he is trying to get into evidence this issue of uh, intoxication and having it to do with the voluntariness of her confession, even though she doesn't make a confession until the next day. And watch how the state objects and how the judge rules. Let me take you back to the morning of finding George Torres in the suitcase. You called 911? Is it true that uh, Detective or Deputy Kirill Rodriguez of the Sheriff's Department arrived? Yes. What mental state did you have at that time? I was very confused. Um, it was very hazy. I didn't understand the monumental amount of people that were there. And Is she really saying that she didn't understand that after having killed her boyfriend that there would be a lot of people there? Maybe a lot of police, maybe a lot of investigators, detectives, forensic scientists, that sort of thing. That never popped into her head. Starting at the very beginning, this woman is losing a great deal of credibility with this judge. What they were doing with taking from my home, I was worried about my dogs. Um, I was worried about my son. I was, I was in shock. I was traumatized by the situation. How's that again? You were traumatized by the situation? You didn't spend the night in a suitcase. You spent the night nursing a bottle of wine in a hangover. It, again, he should have spent a lot more time with her going over her testimony if this is what she was going to sell, because there are a lot better ways to get this into evidence than what she's doing here and then trying to focus on everything that was going on, on my, at my home, um, I was hung over. I was still, I believe, intoxicated to a degree. Objection, Judge, moved to strike. This is outside their motion to suppress. They have not made any allegations that her statement was involuntary because of her mental state or state of intoxication. Response? 
Judge, we're talking about, I'm, I'm just getting some preliminary information. We're, we're, Our interrogation is the next day. The state has an obligation, and the case law cited by the state requires specificity in the motions. So it's not a game of 20 questions and a surprise. Okay, okay. This, this is Are the day before the interrogation. I understand that. We're not, we're not talking about an intoxication. Are you going to be arguing anything in conclusions to what happened on February 24th led to any coercive or coercion behavior? On behalf of the Orange County Sheriff's Office on February 25, are you going to bootstrap or link any of those things together? The interrogation in the squad car and what was said to her prior to getting in the squad car that relates to what she said about it being routine protocol, yes. All right, I'm going to sustain the state's objection. Relating to the intoxication? Yes. Okay. It wasn't raised in any of the three motions that have been filed. Judge, I didn't ask her that. She volunteered. I understand it. Okay. Objection sustained okay. and stricken. One of the things that I have found when I have made objections and when the other people have made objections to my statements is that the judge will usually hear the objection and then if it's somebody else making the objection, he'll look at me and go, you know, with kind of raise his eyebrows. It's, well, what do you have to say? And I'll put my position forward and he'll think about it for a minute and say, not a full minute, but, you know, a couple of seconds and say, no, I'm going to sustain their objection. And uh, if the same issue comes up again later on, that objection is going to be sustained again. And of course, one of the ways that that happens a lot is in leading questions, as I've talked about before. Well, he is trying to put on his own witness and he can't ask leading questions. And in addition to that, he has to make sure that he gets in all the foundational elements. Watch what happens when the state objects and the judge will ask him for his position and then boom the ruling comes in just like that it's it's pretty awesome to watch for a couple of reasons one because the prosecutor is doing a good job of making good evidentiary objections and in the last couple of trials that i've looked at anyway they have simply let a lot of stuff that should never have come in come in uh, on the prosecutorial side and even on the defense side. It's like somebody decided to suspend objections for the day. But in this case, the objections are being made and they're being ruled on. Let's watch. Speak to the deputy about what has happened. Yes. Okay. And then were you asked to stay on scene? By both, yes. By both detectives, yes. Okay. How long did it take the detectives to arrive after you had spoken initially with Deputy Rodriguez? It was not right away. I don't know specifically, but it was not quickly. Okay. Did the detectives, the two detectives, when they arrived, did they take over the investigation? Um, it was my understanding, yes. No foundation for it. Sustained. At, at some point, were, were the detectives directing you what to do and where to go? Yes. Okay. Can you explain what the detectives told you as it relates to you getting in the, in the car? What, was the phone issued before the car? Yes. Sustained. Was a, let, me, let me ask you about the phone. When were you first asked about your phone? From my remembering, it was once they arrived, one of the first questions that Pope Saul asked me was if I owned a phone. And what did you tell her? I told her it was on the kitchen counter. All right. And what happened next as it relates to the phone? Um, I believe that it was brought to her with someone else. I don't remember. Sustained. Now, one of the reasons you want to have a hearing to suppress the evidence, as I said before, is to kill this idea that, you know, this statement was voluntary and get the judge to suppress it. Uh, so that you can make your battered spouse defense, but I don't see that working. Keep in mind there is a significant danger in putting your client on the stand during a suppression hearing, and that is that your client is under oath, and the narrative that she is establishing right now is testimony that is under oath that the jury is never going to see unless 
and it's a big unless. So, for example, where she testified, I was confused, I was hazy, I was, you know, a little bit out of my element, the way she was saying before. And then she goes to trial and she elects to take the stand. And now she testifies, well, you know, I was sharp as a tack. I knew exactly what they were telling me. I could see through them. And people like her almost always elect to take the stand because they just can't help themselves. They think that surely if they get on the stand and tell them how this all happened and why she was an abused spouse, well, surely they'll let her go. You know, they're not thinking rationally at this point because they know they're going to spend probably the rest of their lives in an iron box and they don't want to do that. So there is a risk to her. And I don't think that this is the testimony that he's getting here in any way is worth that risk. But I'll leave that to you to decide. Now, this objection, I think, is especially interesting. What you'll notice here is that he is, that the, the defense attorney is getting into uh, what was happening in the interview room, and the issue seems to be whether or not she was in custody. He's asking for the Ramirez factors, which relate to the uh, this, whether or not somebody feels that they are in custody or not or actually whether or not somebody is in custody, because whether they feel like they're in custody or not is not really germane. Listen to the objection. Listen to the rather halting response, because I don't think this attorney has ever had that objection made in this context before. And then listen to Judge Cranick as he deals with that objection. So she read the Miranda rights to you. Except number nine. Except number nine. She read the rights, and then she said, do you understand what I've just read to you? And you agree that you had? Yes. But you were not read having these rights in mind. Do you agree to speak to me now? Overruled. I was not asked that question. Is it fair to say that after she read the Miranda rights and after she said, do you understand the rights that I've just read to you, that she went right into the questioning? She did, correct. So she never got the answer from you. Do you agree to speak to us now? I was never asked that. The way that she acted, the things that she said, the fact that they had your phone. Did you get did you get the impression you were not getting your phone back if you didn't answer the questions? Sustained. She was in custody. Yeah, it's been conceded by the state. In their response, there was a custodial interrogation. Okay, but she wasn't aware of it. She wasn't aware she was in custody. What does her subjective perception matter? Well, under the circumstances, it would matter. I mean, she she didn't feel she was free to leave. It, 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 she was in an enclosed small space. Um, she was. That all goes to whether or not. Quest- she, let me finish. She was being questioned by two lead detectives, homicide detectives. One of them was wearing a firearm. Um, she was trying to cooperate as best she could. I think her her position is that she was coerced in answering the question. What does that have to do with coercion? Those are all factors that under Ramirez as to whether or not it was custodial. This is going to be a very interesting case. And the reason it's going to be an interesting case is because the judge is doing a lot of really good work. He knows the case. He knows the facts. He knows all the different versions of the the story that she has told. And I think he's going to hold her feet to the fire and, by extension, her lawyer's feet to the fire. As you may also know, of course, the hurricane's coming in, so they've pushed the trial back to next week. We won't get any video this week. But I did want to get this out. I had planned to get it out this weekend, but sometimes stuff happens and you don't get to things. So forgive me for that. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If it's been interesting, give me a thumbs up, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff if you haven't already. And if you have the opportunity today, do something nice for someone. And if you have comments, drop them on the comments down below. You email me at the address above and then come on back here tomorrow and we'll talk about something else. Hey, as I said at the beginning, none of what I said is legal advice, but let me tell you what, the stuff that's gonna be right up here, 
These are the things that YouTube thinks you might be interested in going forward. Have a terrific day.